Hey everyone, Joey here, aka Animus, and today, as a Patreon request from Zach Adams, I'm going to be reviewing every album by the band Skinny Puppy. Well, here we are, my third ever discography review, and my second one that's been requested by a Patreon subscriber, and welcome to what will possibly be the single video of mine that's taken the longest to put together, or at least feels like the deepest dive into a band or artist. Kind of been working on this ever since February, if you look at it a certain way. Big delays, GCSEs and everything, but I'm very excited to be finally filming this. Now, my Orteca and Yellow Magic Orchestra videos were very first impression based, and it kind of shows. I'm still very proud of them, but this time, even though this is still music that I'm new to and I won't pretend to be an expert on, I'm trying to sort of combine that sense of discovery with something a little bit more in-depth and informative, going a bit deeper into the history of the band and taking a wider view of their story. I don't know exactly how long this video is going to end up, but I am reviewing 13 albums today, so grab a snack, strap in, and make yourself comfortable. Skinny Puppy was founded in 1982 in Canada by Kevin Crompton out of creative differences with his increasingly poppy new wave band Images in Vogue. Though it was initially conceived as a side project, he ended up focusing on it full time, and brought along another Kevin, Kevin Graham Ogilvie, as vocalist. The former thought of the stage name Kevin Key, Kevin with a lowercase c and a capital E, and the latter called himself Nivek Ogre. He described the central premise of their music, with its dark electro-industrial sound, as life through a dog's eyes. And their first proper release, the Back and Forth EP, came in 1984, under the help of Images and Vogue producer Dave Ogilvie. So we have three band members, among which there are two Kevins and two Ogilvies, and no one is related to each other. So, uh, got it? Nice. The band was signed to Network, given a studio to work in, and completed their configuration with Bill Lieb, who would later found Frontline Assembly and Delirium, and so we come to the first substantial Skinny Puppy release. <laughs> So for these first few albums, I'm going to have a few uh, confusing technical things to do with the track listings to go over. Remission was originally an EP, but later extended to an album with subsequent reissues, hence why I've named it Album Zero. However, the tracks Film and Icebreaker of this extended version I deemed part of their next album, since they also show up there. I especially urge you to skip the version of Icebreaker that appears on Spotify, since it begins with the same sample as the track before it, as well as creating a weird abrupt transition, making for a very weird listening experience. But all that aside, listening to Remission, it's clear that this was a very pioneering album for the electro-industrial sound. You've got a combination of some sounds that are pretty distinctly 80s, and others that seem far ahead of their time and wildly creative. Clearly a ton of effort went in to its elaborate, erratic production. We've got numerous horror film samples, which will go on to be a recurring theme in their career, and the use of effects and processing is bold and exciting. Honestly, it's mainly just the timbre of the drums that gives it away as an 80s record and not something from the industrial scene of far later on. It still sounds pretty damn heavy and has the ability to shock and surprise. Smothered Hope acts as a sort of mission statement for the band, an introduction to the mix of nihilistic themes and abstract gothic imagery that will pervade their work. Glass Houses has some icy synth arpeggios and rap-adjacent vocal delivery. There's a remix called Glass Out included on the expanded edition, which adds some more noisy and chaotic production. It's interesting, if not essential. Manhole offers a compelling noise-influenced sound that seems way ahead of its time for 84. Solvent's instrumental marries the skeletal and the screeching to powerful effect. Ogre's vocals sound particularly evil and metallically processed, here. Sleeping Beast has a fantastic percussion section, with skittering rhythms and samples that sound like some huge door being slammed and an object being dropped down a metal pipe or something. 
really strong industrial imagery here, taking the genre term quite literally. Brap is a bit weak as a closer on the extended version, a slightly goofy minute-long instrumental loop with samples of dialogue and screaming on top, but the album experience is definitely solid overall. Particularly listening to this for the first time, I wasn't quite sold on the vocals, they're passionate and suited to the musical style, but in, on this particular record could seem a little silly or grating here and there. They definitely took some getting used to, particularly on a track like Incision, which takes their nasal snarliness to an extreme. Coming back a second time, this does rather feel like the band in prototype phase, and it perhaps doesn't have the best flow as an EP or an album album, but it's still a striking introduction to their sound that holds up well many decades later, and an essential building block in the story of the band. And here we have their first straight up LP, although it's another confusing one in terms of track listing. As suggested by the requester, I went for the 70 minute reissue, but left one track out that was also on the next record. Why do they do this? Bites is largely a development and expansion of the sounds and themes on remission, but is a more refined and varied listen. The opener Assimilate is their biggest track on Spotify for great reason, a commanding start to the album, with its hypnotic sonic battery set to a triplet groove. That's surprisingly catchy, with the band's refined melodic sensibilities going up against a particularly urgent performance from Ogre, and it also serves as an introduction to the new puppy sound which is more icy and clean while retaining its gothic atmosphere and bite. From there, the album showcases the band's wide range of abilities, from pieces that are downright unsettling and hellish, to brooding and atmospheric soundscapes, to tracks that absolutely groove like a mofo for no reason. I am looking at you, the choke. It's certainly experimental, particularly for the time it came out in, but in the case of many tracks, the instrumentals at their core f actually feel quite poppy, and very few ideas stick around long enough to outstay their welcome, making this one of their albums that I feel could most easily hook the average listener. Blood on the Wall showcases their ability to create dense, brooding, nightmarish soundscapes out of repeated repeated mantras and swirling whirlwinds of samples. The use of samples in particular continues to be far more intriguing and forward-thinking than what I've heard from the vast majority of their contemporaries. Church's atonal instrumental and repetitive vocal samples grab me a bit less, but then Icebreaker, which does belong on this album, is pretty compelling in its unsettling, dirge-like atmosphere. Elsewhere, Tomorrow creates an immersive sonic environment with skittering glitches, escalating crashes, and suspended, melancholic chords. And then the aforementioned The Choke has no business going this hard. A mesmerizing example of this album fusing the danceable with the gothic and bizarre in a way that's not at all as oxymoronic as it might sound on paper. There's this super amped up aggressive synth line on this track that's somehow irresistible. Basement slightly threw me for a loop with the same Legend of Hill House sample as you can find on Orbital's I Don't Know You People. For me, it's linked to the latter track as inextricable, but it's a completely natural fit in the skinny puppy universe. Last Call is another more accessible cut following the Assimilate formula to a similarly punchy effect, even if it doesn't quite hit the same level of memorability. Then the reissue ends with a pair of instrumental cuts including the near 10 minute long The Center Bullet. Though not relaxing by any means, they end the album on a very interesting note, almost hopeful after the darkness that looms over the rest of the album. So yeah, the overall experience does very much depend on which version you're listening to. The only track on the original version that I'm not too keen on is Social Deception, which just feels a little overwhelmingly dejected for my liking, and there are a couple more weak spots among the eight tracks that the reissue adds. I mentioned Church before, but Dead Doll, Christianity, and Falling don't feel like they add too much to the overall experience. However, if you listen to the original version, you miss out on what's definitely a more intriguing and varied selection overall, particularly with those last two tracks, and even the less individually memorable moments still fit right in and keep the momentum of the album going. 
This is still not the type of music I generally seek out, but I was pretty hooked by this release, and noticed myself growing more drawn in by what Skinny Puppy do. For example, I definitely got more into the vocals, probably a combination of Ogre's refined technique, mixing that emphasizes the voice less, and I guess me being more accustomed to their sound in general. I initially wrote more tasteful in my notes. So Bites on the whole is definitely in the upper echelons of the Skinny Puppy catalog for me, an improvement on all fronts after their debut that had me excited to delve further into the band's twisted world. In 1986, Bill Lieb left the band to focus on Frontline Assembly and was replaced by Dwayne Gettel as producer, I believe I pronounced that correctly but do correct me if I'm wrong, who the band said took their sound to the next level, and this is clearly evident on third album Mind, where they travel even deeper into the abstract, the dreamlike, and the disturbing. The vocals here often feel less commanding, more lost in the periphery of these completely overwhelming soundscapes. There's often so much going on at once that the pieces threaten to teeter over into chaos but never quite get there, and still always feel cutting and sharp, which is quite the feat of production, particularly for the 80s. Honestly, I kinda loved this album on first listen. One Time, One Place opens with a poppy synth arpeggio that might have you believe it's about to follow in the footsteps of their previous album opener but the wayward kinetic crashing of the snare drum, the dense reverb, the aggressive layered vocals, and the noisy samples littering the soundscape show you just what you're getting into with this record. God's Gift Maggots is one of the most intense pieces they ever put together, with a deeply unsettling atmosphere and the phrase God gave maggots screamed with disturbing intensity. And no track is more exemplary of this album's unbelievable composition than the predominantly instrumental Stairs and Flowers, a fever dream or more like fever nightmare that feels like being lost in an Escher painting that keeps sending you back to where you started. So many sound bites, crashing, swelling, colliding, all to this demented cyclical rhythm. It's almost head spinning, but never quite gets to that point of being too much. 200 Years takes a similar approach with a pummeling mechanical percussion section. As I said before, really leaning quite literally into the concept of industrial music. Antagonism perhaps has a more easily palatable instrumental, but Ogre channels a kind of energy here that isn't really quite matched on any of the band's other records, maybe bar one, sounding completely gripped by some feverish insanity. Dig It, however, takes a bit more of an all-round accessible approach, at least on the mix that's on Spotify, the 12-inch anthology mix, with a tight groove and, unusually for the band, some licks of guitar. But don't go thinking they're suddenly creating a simple dance track. The lyrics, such as the mantra of freedom as an offering, ensure that the repetitive rhythm feels like that of a march enforced by the corrupt overlords of some dystopian future. And the eight minute closer, Burnt With Water, is another chance for the album's incredible production and artfully hellish use of samples to shine, suitably closing the album with its most grandiose piece. Mind is easily one of their most provocative, challenging releases, down to the title and cover, which yes, as a side note, is taken from a film. It might be a bit hard to listen to for some, and I'll admit I could certainly be in the wrong mood to enjoy this. I did have one listen where I felt particularly fatigued by the end, but honestly, the album's darkness is mesmerizing. Even when it's oppressively bleak and grisly, it feels impossible to turn away from and demands your full attention, leaving you pretty breathless. I don't think I've ever heard anything that sounds quite like this, particularly from the mid-80s. It was undoubtedly my favourite album of the three I've talked about so far on my first listen, and I don't get the vibe that this is a very popular opinion maybe, but coming back to it again proves that it might be a contender for my favourite Skinny Puppy album overall, to be honest. Desire. 
I don't have quite as much to say about Cleanse Fold and Manipulate in terms of its development of their sound. It's a small step back from the dense and overwhelming nature of Mind, but by no means a step down in quality and still offers some compelling new creative directions. It's still full of lurid sonic environments and unconventionally structured tracks with a particular emphasis on multi-phased instrumentals, but many other tracks feel more direct in their arrangement and messaging. We've got some actual intelligible vocals here. And their pretty immaculate production continues to develop, becoming sharper and more refined. In terms of lyrical themes, what I picked up on was mostly critiques of all forms of control over human lives, often through abstract macabre imagery. But looking a bit further into it, it's also their most observational album thus far. For example, First Aid continues the trend of each album opening with a synth banger. Ogre gives one of his most passionately twisted performances here. And I didn't pick up on this initially, but this track was written about the growing AIDS epidemic, which adds some especially dark undertones to the piece. Addiction has one of their melodies that's most stuck in my head. It's also got a lengthier, sort of sharper, cleaner sounding alternate version called First Dose, which I see why some people, such as the person who requested this video, prefer to the original. Shadowcast has this one rhythmic sound effect that's like a pair of metal pipes clacking together that for some reason just really scratches my brain. <laughs> Draining Faces is a very memorable cut with its cinematic build over the course of five minutes, from cavernous gothic ambience and disparate vocal samples to a fusel Blade of mangled beats which Ogre's ghostly delivery drifts above to particularly haunting effect. Perhaps one of my favourite Skinny Puppy tracks, Full Stop. Deep Down Trauma Hounds gets straight to the point with a driving beat that just smashes you in the face, and a sharp critique of the dark and cynical world that Ogre saw much of the youth of the time growing up in. His last line on the album that's clearly spoken enough to linger with you is, those who have no rights display the right to have no life. To have respect is to accept a world committing suicide, which is one of the most biting lyrical moments in their whole discography. Then in the following track, Anger, he seems to lose all human qualities. The vocals are guttural, toneless shouts. I've seen some especially intense looking footage of a live performance of this track. And we conclude with a short ambient epilogue which builds into a jump scare of sorts as a sound somewhere between a French horn and a piece of construction machinery comes blasting out of the silence, shaking the listener up one last time. It wasn't initially an album that stood out to me much or seemed a particularly important development in the context of their discography, but looking back, this is another very strong effort with no bad tracks and some twistedly unique ideas that, again, don't really compare to anything else I've heard before. Which gives you this really fantastic sense of discovery as a music listener. <laughs> That is a cool ass album title. You've got the word vivisect, you've got sect six giving it evil corporation vibes, and you've got 666. There's layers. This album marks one of the biggest aesthetic shifts in their whole catalogue and is without a doubt the most crushing and kinetic release from the band up to this point. With these heavy, distorted drum patterns and a distinctly metallic bite. Again, very provocative and thick with darkness. The lyrics can simply be a string of grotesque images. Ogre's vocals seem quite stylistically different a lot of the time, moving away from metal-adjacent snarls to more of an enunciated, punkish sound. This album is not easy on the ears, uh, but an incredibly forward-thinking record again, to the extent that I would Honestly, never have guessed that it came out before the 1990s. Dog shit pretty immediately grabs you by the neck and lets you know exactly what you're getting in for. A swirling, snapping tornado of industrial chaos. It's a prime example of the record's lyrical style. The words often lack a clear narrative or sometimes grammar, <laughs> but parallel the music by almost overwhelming the listener with all sorts of grisly images, creating a very tangible aesthetic. 
You can't deny they know exactly what they're going for. VX gas attack, meanwhile, is kind of complicated. The beat absolutely bangs and kind of makes me want to tap my feet, but the lyrics are a very unflinching and detailed account of uh, chemical bombings in the Middle East. Uh, it kind of felt a little bit emotionally detached at first, particularly having studied this kind of thing in history, but I, I guess that's perhaps a kind of deliberate irony, maybe there's some commentary they're trying to make here about the nonchalant nature of some of the West during these events. Harsh Stone White is one of the more melodic cuts on this album, but centers itself around another one of those distinctly skinny puppy beats that buzz and whir like the inside of an evil factory from the future. Human Disease Scum is among the most punk sounding pieces that the band ever put together, and musically is absolutely cacophonous, though again not quite to the point of absurdity. I could see this perhaps inspiring music records like Bluff Limbo, i.e. I think it's very cool. Testure is a criticism of animal testing, one of the central themes of the record, and is pretty lyrically disturbing, but musically is a bit of a breather in the context of the album, with some glassy, melancholic synth lines. And this seems to be totally intentional, Ogre apparently said in an interview, it's the only song I think they will be able to play on the radio, I hope they do play it because it's the only way we can go beyond our ranks and our loyal fans who already understand the message. And on the subject of pieces that were very topical for their time, State Aid was another track written about the ongoing AIDS crisis. And uh, this one sounds straight up hellish. Musically, I'll admit it's one example of Skinny Puppy going so noisy and atonal that I personally find it difficult to have fun with. Not that fun is particularly the point of this music, but others might feel different, and I can't say it's not compelling. I certainly appreciate that this listening journey has stretched me in a way. Then there's a stretch of more instrumental heavy tracks that close the CD version, and these really show off the production, which as I mentioned, might be some of the most cutting edge sound design I've ever heard from an 80s album. Fritter, Stella's home begins in unsettling ambient territory, then transitions into what sounds like a chiastic slide track with the sound palette of Incunabula. I feel like I can imagine Orteca listening to these guys. Pumpkin Park Zoos marries crunchy saturation with reverberating percussion and cavernous washes of synth. And Fungus, with two S's, is absolutely crushing. So unbelievably dense and abrasive that it becomes almost surreal and is kind of perversely fun to listen to. During this era, their live shows were becoming more and more shocking and getting more press for this reason. The tour followed the concept of a vivisectionist who ends up going through a transformation that puts him in the place of one of his subjects. You can see some clips on YouTube and it's pretty theatrical stuff. And they actually had an early form of Nine Inch Nails as their support act, and I should have mentioned, I think you can see some pretty clear inspiration coming from Skinny Puppy toward Nine Inch Nails. And it's interesting to kind of take a step further back in time because Nine Inch Nails kind of were the extent of my industrial music knowledge before I started making this video, to be honest, uh, but I digress. I totally see why this particular release got so many people's attention. It really grabs you and puts you right in the midst of their uncommon compromising vision. I can't say it'll go into regular rotation for me without being immediately followed by an ambient detox, but this was an exciting album to check out, and I really admire the new creative direction they went in here, as well as the craft that went into fully realising it in all its macabre glory. Here we have their final album from the 1980s, and I haven't got a whole ton to say about some of these tracks. Rebe's mostly dials down the chaos and intensity and goes for a cleaner, more danceable sound. So I can definitely imagine this being overall a more palatable record to a wider audience than Vivisect 6. We've also got some more use of electric guitar here and there, courtesy of Al Jorgensen, or Jorgensen maybe that's pronounced, frontman of industrial metal band Ministry, who also adds some extra vocals. I think the guitars are pretty tastefully used and don't shift the band too drastically away from their electro-industrial aesthetic, 
but fans were understandably a little divided over this edition. And there was also a bit of a rift in the band itself. Gettle described the album at the time as his favourite they'd ever made, but Key thought that Jorgensen was actually trying to break the band up. But I'm not going to speculate or go too deep into band drama. What did I think of this album? We do get some pretty unique additions to their catalogue from this album. Fascist Jock Itch in particular has one of the most thrash metal sounding electronic beats I've ever heard and is essentially a thrash track. Tin Omen later follows in a similar vein. I enjoy the vocal processing that makes Ogre sound particularly inhuman and demonic. I'd understand if you thought this metal adjacent style was a little jarring coming from Skinny Puppy, but I appreciate them stretching their sound into new territories. On the other hand, Warlock is easily the most popular track on here, and one of the most recognisable pieces the band ever made. It feels closer to the synth-pop standards of the time, particularly since the vocals are more toned down and sometimes layered with vocoders. It's a very solid and memorable tune. It feels like their albums generally have one track like this, which especially appeals to less gothic listeners, but tracks like these never really feel jarring or like sellout moves, especially since Warlock's music video was somewhat infamous for stringing together clips from some particularly nasty horror films. We've also got some weird little beatless interludes in the form of Rain and Amputate, and the general stylistic trend of the album is completely thrown out the window with the CD version's closer, a 16 minute live rendition of a track called Spahn Dirge, and uh, how do I put this into words? It's like staring into a bottomless black pit except also all of your neurons are firing at once. It doesn't feel like much of a dirge either, it reminds me of the energy that can sometimes used to bring to massive cuts like these. Targo Margo is probably my favourite rock album of all time, so you can imagine this was pretty up my street. I don't know if this was the kind of thing they'd regularly do live, but it's certainly a unique listen as part of a Skinny Puppy album. So I'm um, overall not too sure where I stand with this record. It often offers some compelling snapshots that don't sound like anything else they've released, and nothing pops out to me as a dud, but it doesn't come together as much of a strong or cohesive whole, and you can sometimes tell that the band weren't as confident or enjoying themselves as much as usual, but this would go on to improve as we finally move out of the 80s. <laughs> And here they didn't go 90s at all, they did exactly what they'd always done best, just the times had finally caught up with them. That's the thing, I guess you could say that Skinny Puppy albums had always sounded dated, but there hasn't been any huge shift in palette throughout these albums, but I'd say their style fit just as well into the 90s as it did the 80s. That's just how ahead of the curve they'd been. Too Dark Park was described by the band as an attempt to reassess everything about themselves and combine the best aspects of their signature sound with fresh ideas, leading to what is described by many as their greatest ever album. And I can definitely understand why. It didn't initially feel like a huge standout in their discography, but it really clicked properly when I came back to their albums a second time, and now feels right up there with mind as a contender for my favourite. The opener Convulsion is a brutal, incredibly dense soundscape that would have you believe that this album's about to be more intense than it turns out to be. Don't get me wrong, it's a dark listen and by no means a step back in forcefulness, but with tracks like Fungus and Spahn Dirge, they seem to have found the logical extreme of their sonic brutality. Also, I wrote at the time, <laughs> Spasmolytic is an absolute banger. It's strangely hypnotic and catchy with its repeated refrain of kicking the habit, and live drums breathe some extra life into the track. A very nice addition whenever they show up on the album. Shorelined Poison is another wild ride with rolling, pummeling beats and samples that are crushed and mangled to a skull-rattling degree. Grave Wisdom is driving and exhilarating with chords that burst out at you like you're surrounded by flashing lights. TFWO brings back the guitars, but only as a subtle ornament to a super menacing track that feels more distinctly Skinny Puppy than anything off Rabies. And Reclamation is an incredible 
incredibly powerful closer, gradually layering ominous ambience, crashing drums, orchestral samples, and distant shouts, like gathering storm clouds before the heavens burst at the two minute mark into a vivid rush of noise. A fantastically creative way to end the album, and another one of their best tracks. Really nothing negative immediately comes to mind about Two Dark Park, it's got some of the best songwriting, performances, and production of the band's whole career, and holds up incredibly well 30 years later. It's a bold reinvigoration for the band that feels very tight and focused throughout, presenting all its ideas in a cohesive and enjoyable way within just 10 tracks and 38 minutes. Just short enough for the album's abrasive sound design and high levels of distortion not to become overbearing. It's undoubtedly one of the Skinny Puppy records that I'd most strongly recommend, and that I see myself coming back to the most. It's important to note how troubled the conception of Last Rites was. There was a growing schism in the band at the time, and they were becoming less and less functional as a group. Ogre's drug use was growing increasingly problematic, creating health problems that would lead to him going to rehab after the recording sessions for this album were complete. For the recording process, Ogilvy would work with Key and Gettel and then Ogre separately, and this resulted in a disconnect between the vocals and the music, which perhaps contributed to making the sound of this album even more discordant and unnerving than usual, and... Holy shit, this album is a lot to take in. Just as I thought we'd reached the extreme of their nightmarish songcraft, this album ventures out even further into the void. It's a brutal, unrelenting, oppressive record with overwhelming walls of samples, high emotional intensity in the vocals, and occasionally extreme uses of distortion. And out of a dark time for the band, we ended up with easily one of their most compelling and unique bodies of work. The opener Love in Vain begins in familiar territory for the band, but there's a creeping sense that something's not quite the same, but with the sense of hopelessness in the lyrics and the sinister orchestral samples that bring in a particularly strong sense of incongruence. And Killing Game develops all of these emotions, described as their first ballad. It was one of the most striking things the band could do at this point to bring in some tenderness to their music, and in the context of the skinny puppy sound, the plaintive organ drone and wistful piano that the, the, the ogre's emotionally candid delivery brought some unexpectedly strong emotional punch, making this perhaps the most moving piece in the band's whole catalogue, but then Nowhere abruptly smashes this mood to pieces, with a cavernous beat that makes it seem as if the track is trying to destroy itself with metal punches. The vocals seem to be crying out, trying to be heard as they get swept away in a great, overwhelming tide of noise. This sounds incredibly unpleasant on paper, and yet, on a second listen, I found myself so overcome by the human emotion at the core of this piece that I genuinely had tears pricking the back of my eyes, and had to pause for a breather. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly what gives this particular album this effect, but it's a very profound feeling, though with the knowledge that Ogre was experiencing vivid hallucinations during many recording sessions, and had to be taken to hospital due to a seizure after recording for this particular track, does make it quite hard to listen to. Inquisition returns to the themes of animal cruelty that were found on Vivisect 6, over a synth-heavy instrumental that's more in line with most of their 80s work, but its surreal descents into pounding cycles of industrial rhythms set it apart as its own beast entirely. Scrapyard already sounds pretty harrowing before the entire mix suddenly erodes itself into an enveloping blast of saturated noise. One of the most arresting moments in their discography that feels as if you, the listener, are experiencing some kind of apparition. River's End and Lost Chance are a pair of instrumental cuts, 
The former I'm more keen on, with its intricate layering of sounds and strong sense of atmosphere. The latter has more of a steady, cyclical pulse and more minimal arrangement, and no, please don't sample that! Circus Dance, however, is another nightmarish excursion that again includes a moment of pure, overwhelming noise, but then finally opens out into something straight up beautiful. It's probably one of my favourite ever tracks by the band, with the range of potent emotions that it managed to give me over its runtime. And the final track, Download, is essentially their Revolution 9. Five minutes of frantic sound collage built from a hellish whirlwind of fleeting fragments, before in its second half the track flatlines into a drone that's not exactly comforting, but in context, genuinely peaceful. With this track, the band venture into truly avant-garde territory, making for a listen that's unlike anything that came before or after in their catalogue, and it's a bit of a microcosm of Last Rites overall. It's definitely the most uncompromising Skinny Puppy album, but also perhaps the one with the most depth and layers to pick apart, hence the level of detail I've chosen to go into with this one. It's a pretty harrowing, enigmatic record, and one that truly sticks with you. Though a very different beast, I'd say it's up there with Mind and Too Dark Park on the podium of my favourite albums from this entire listening journey. The long production process of their eighth studio album was even more turbulent than what we've seen before, due to disagreements, drug use, and expenses. The band were alternating between three producers, and Dwayne Gettle tragically died of a heroin overdose after recording for this album, leaving Key and Ogre to do the mixing. And I wish this record could honour Gettle's memory, but honestly, all of the above kind of shows. I'm afraid the process is… not very good. In fact, it's the only Skinny Puppy album that I definitively wasn't keen on. As such, I don't feel like focusing on this one for too long, but I'll try my best to explain my thoughts. This album goes for more of a conventional, industrial metal sound, with more prominent guitars again. We've got a concept about a psychotherapy cult from the 1960s called The Process Church of the Final Judgement, which is… cool, but… In practice, these themes kind of wash over you. Well, they washed over me, at least. Without this context, the lyrics would often just strike you as the usual mix of themes of corruption and darkness in society. Honestly, the lyrics are kind of one of the strongest points of this album. Just if the music was more enjoyable and let me hear them more, then I'd want more to spend time picking them apart. And speaking of the vocals, they're a lot more clean than usual, they're often sung, and there's really very much processing on them. This is unusual to hear, but not really the problem here. The process just overall feels unnecessary, it doesn't really add much to the Skinny Puppy discography, has less of a distinct identity, weaker production, weaker mixing and mastering, less adventurous or forward-thinking songwriting. Often I kind of just wanted to listen to their earlier work instead, or that of their contemporaries. Jaya at least has some interesting ideas, it opens the album with a pretty strong atmosphere, and sounds heavy as it moves through its multiple phases. Though something's a little off about the mixing, it's a bit of a fatiguing overload at points. Death is far less remarkable, one of multiple tracks here that kind of just feel like archetypal skinny puppy with less flavour and tooth. The vocals on Candle are so strangely dry and awkwardly shoved out in the open on top of unflatteringly thin production. I can praise Hard Set Head for being relatively creative as it brings some very driving, slightly Gabba influenced electronic textures, though it is a bit of a musical bludgeoning that teeters on the edge of excess. No, if you want an example of this album falling off the edge, look no further than Blue Surge. Its driving atonal techno groove seemed cool and somewhat new for the band at first, but the sounds just keep on layering and layering without the sense of balance that usually holds their more overwhelming tracks together, and it 
just became obnoxious and a bit of a headache. I find it hard to imagine much time being spent sober in the mixing booth on this one. Perhaps the one skinny puppy track I outright disliked. Process and Mortar are pretty solid with their fast-paced, vaguely IDM-ish rhythms that definitely had a fair amount of effort and work put into them, and the album did technically managed to get a visceral reaction out of me, since the band decided to put a Last Rite style noise jump scare at the end in the form of the sub-minute outro Cellar Heat, but honestly I was left feeling very little at all. The process is in this weird spot where it includes both music that takes too little risks and doesn't set itself apart enough from their many existing albums, and tracks that try a new direction, but are too slapdash and shoddily constructed for me to fully get into them. Very unusually for the band, the production is a weak link, often striking me as dated and kinda ugly, not nearly hitting the level of ingenuity that the band have proven themselves to be capable of before. It's not a bad album, but it's nowhere near their best, and I can't say I see myself ever returning to it, if I'm being honest. After the process, the band went quiet for a while, but was certainly not inactive. Instead, we got a period where the group's members were focusing on solo material. Nivek Ogre was working on his poppier, but still industrial Ogre, that's O-H-G-R, project with Mark Walk. Key's side project Download continued in full swing, and he also put out his first solo album. And Dave Ogilvy was working for several well-regarded names, such as Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, and David Bowie on his drum and bass leaning Earthling, as well as working on the mixing for his Best of Bowie compilation. Speaking of Dave Ogilvy's mixing, I've recently discovered a little bit of fun trivia, which is that he actually works on none other than Call Me Maybe by Carly Rae Jepsen, and I just think it's absolutely incredible that we live on a timeline where that happens. Anyway, on a slightly more serious note, the band's drug use was slowing down at this time, and Key and Ogre were thankfully able to become close again. Though Dave declined to join the pair, they performed at Doomsday Festival in Dresden as a skinny puppy reunion. Then Walk joined the lineup, and the three got into the studio in 2003 for a comeback album. The Greater Wrong of the Right was a 21st first century return with, naturally, probably the biggest self-reinvention in the band's whole catalogue. The writing here is more melodic, the sound is more sharp and digital, leaning into their electronic side pretty heavily with some very detailed production and extensive, complex processing on the vocals and instruments. It Definitely sounds like an album from 2004. At different points it brought to mind BT's emotional technology, early 2000s infected mushroom, and... new metal? The datedness isn't off-putting, as the sounds are used creatively and with a lot of attention to detail. It's a pretty fresh and engaging new take on their sound. I'm Mortal is a super hooky opener, leaning into almost a poppy style while not sacrificing its bite or betraying the core skinny puppy appeal. I found a great quote from Ogre on this matter. We're not just doing this to be these malevolent, malignant, tumor-esque musicians who are continually delving into the evil side of life and supporting it to the very end. Nope, turns out they can have a lot of fun with their sound when they want to. Similar things can be said about Protest, the album's single. It introduces a vocal style they'd use a few different times on this album and their next, a sort of speedily chopped up sing rapping. It's a little absurd and strongly of its time, but it plays into a new type of weirdness that this album explores, a sort of fun weirdness that's very refreshing. Other highlights include Ghost Man, which in its final minute drifts off into hyper-detailed, brain-scratching IDM and sounds excellent. Past Present, a layered and ambitious piece that builds a dark and meditative atmosphere over the course of six and a half minutes. And Ganeja, Ganeha, doesn't really matter, that doesn't seem to be a real word, which takes the aforementioned vocal style into even more robotic territory over a skittering fusillade of glitches. 
After the process, this album was kind of a breath of fresh air. It seems that after some time away, the band managed to reunite with a replenished creative drive and far more of a clear vision. It's not quite great, not every track jumped out at me, and your enjoyment of their new sound definitely depends on your fondness for this specific time period, which the album very much smacks of. But honestly, this album was just plain enjoyable and had me really looking forward to what would come of this new era. <laughs> There's um, nothing exactly explicit on that album cover, I just wanted to spare you having to look at a particular part of it. Three years later, Mythmaker was a pretty simple follow-up to their last record with the same core personnel. Ogre was going through a slightly rougher spot at the time in his personal life, but the band was still going strong. In fact, music making was kind of a way for him to release some of his feelings. Now, I'm gonna get straight to the point on this one. I wasn't all that keen on Mythmaker initially. Skinny Puppy have always had a rough and gritty sound palette, of course, but in a way reminiscent of the process. A lot of this album came across as a little aesthetically ugly to me in more than the way that was intended. It's mostly aged more unflatteringly than The Greater Wrong of the Right. It easily conjures up imagery of some excessively colour-cast, trashy, mid-2000s horror film. Could be right at home in like a Rob Zombie or a Saw film. Oh, that would be why. I wrote at the time that it was a less dynamic or varied listen and a bit fatiguing. I got to the end and I thought, that was cool, I guess, but I don't particularly feel like ever returning to it. However, it did grow on me as I returned to it. I came to appreciate the interesting and engaging ideas that it brings to the table, such as allowing the listener moments of melodic respite and making room for ambient textures amid its industrial soundscapes, even if the execution is not all that consistently enjoyable for me. I think our opener, Magnificent, was meant to be tongue-in-cheek. There's some absolutely absurd lyrics here and many vocoded oh yes, leading to the track feeling a little corny whether on purpose or not. It's not a bad track by any means. On the other hand, Haze creates a lot of space in its first half, meaning that when it builds into a climax, it has a whole lot more impact and drama. Definitely one of the best tracks on here. Pedafly is an example of the social and political messaging on the album being right up front. I was going to pick out some of the most striking lines on here to point out, but honestly, I do want to keep my channel relatively PG-13. Just note that this track shares a very unique viewpoint on the meaning of life. I did quite enjoy the part where it builds into what sounds like some kind of diabolical march with a particularly evil tritone riff. Jaha is perhaps one of the most spacious and melodic tracks on here. It surprisingly weaves some acoustic guitar and piano into the mix, and is effectively sinister through its restraint, if not hugely memorable. Political, however, makes sure it lodges itself firmly in your head, with some heavy, insistent riffs and sang-wrapped mantras that seem to be comparing corrupt government control to sexual acts. Lester Does was probably the track here that was most immediately up my street since it pushes its fast-paced electronic textures right to the forefront, which are for the most part pretty imaginative and well-crafted. Again, a lot of effort clearly went into the small details, and Pasturn and Ambience had a similar appeal, even if many tracks on their previous record used the sound to a more memorable effect. I think when I mentioned less dynamic, I was probably very swayed by my experience listening to the final track ugly. I still can't really get into this one. It has striking and detailed moments, but for the most part the production here is kind of flatly forceful and the main hook is fatiguingly insistent across six and a half minutes. So Mythmaker does in places have more of its own appeal than I initially gave it credit for, and I appreciate how it can get pretty grandiose. But as a matter of personal taste, something about its overall presentation and aesthetic doesn't quite click with me in a way that it's hard to put my finger on. I mean, the relentless 2007-ness and inextricability from a specific point in time is one thing, but the issue could be to do with mixing and mastering perhaps, since it feels oddly more flat than The Greater Wrong of the Right. It's overall kind of an odd one in their catalogue. 
I understand if you really enjoyed it and found it bold and exciting, but personally my enjoyment is a bit all over the place here. Very soon after Mythmaker, the band returned to the studio and planned a pretty glacial shift in direction, putting together what was essentially noise music, taking its lead from Metal Machine music by Lou Reed. However, their label ran into financial trouble, and while securing a new deal, their vision shifted into something less drastic. While some of these original ideas found a home on their 11th album, especially in the back half, where they're not at all afraid to get really noisy and weird, we ended up with something mostly notably stripped back by their standards, with even greater attention to melody and subtleties. Handover is no late career masterpiece, but basically an improvement upon Mythmaker in every way. In terms of notable moments, Cull or Blind, the album's single, doesn't lean very hard on the sound of the electric guitar, but has a very rocky feel to it, with some brooding verses simmering into a hard-hitting refrain, a solid tune with some hooky melodies. Wavy constructs a spacey atmosphere and again makes way for acoustic guitar in their sound palette. And speaking of striking choices, Gambat utilizes auto-tune and stutter edits over an insistent slamming beat. Meanwhile, Ictums sounds kind of like a techno banger in a club full of vampires. And Point is way out there with perhaps the most unconventional, abrasive sound design since the 1990s, whining and screeching into a twisted rhythm. It's a strangely compelling piece. I'd say Brownstone was the only track that I wasn't into. Just very, very strange and discomforting in its sound design and delivery, to kind of just an unpleasant effect, to be honest. I guess I appreciate them being very much not formulaic here. <laughs> However, the final track, Noise X, surprisingly delivers seven minutes of driving, highly detailed drum and bass, which actually sounds completely natural within their sonic universe, and I was totally down for. It kind of made me wonder why they hadn't already done something of this sort. So this was overall a solid album that found ways to spice things up even this far on in their career, with some fresh ideas and memorable cuts. The band have been going for ever such a long time at this point, and expectedly there's a few little cracks in the track listing, and the album lacks the consistent knack for hook writing that would elevate this type of music to the next level. But Handover's Highs put it roughly on par with The Greater Wrong of the Right for me personally. And at last we come to what appears to be the final ever Skinny Puppy album, which more or less brought their discography full circle through the employment of much of their original 80s gear, as well as, in their words, a return to their old ethos and approach to songwriting. There is also an important backstory to its title and themes of weaponry, but you can research that if you wish, because I've decided to avoid some particularly unpleasant themes in this video. Weapon's minimal yet hard-hitting electronic sound certainly does bring to mind those first two records, but it's also distinctly its own thing. When I mentioned hooks sometimes being a weak point on handover, that is not the case here. Each track is like being strapped into some gigantic machine, perfectly calibrated to lock your mind and body into its twisted grooves. It's not some hugely artistically daring masterwork, but it really does bring back that feeling of straight up fun throughout. Honestly, I can't remember bopping my head this consistently to any of their other albums. There's not a ton to point out about individual tracks here, since they mostly stick to the same core appeal, but I'll still point out some favourites. Warning is like the album's mission statement, it features some memorable icy synth hooks that would probably be right at home on bites. Illicit bangs ridiculously hard, its noisy buzzes and whirs and repeated refrains of this is the criminal age with all sorts of heavy vocal processing reach a heightened level of drama that perhaps is a bit 
over the top, but honestly I see this album as just a little bit tongue-in-cheek, and this track's a ton of fun to listen to. Meanwhile, Solvent pulls off the bold move of directly remaking a track off Remission, bringing everything full circle. I appreciate the original's abrasive, psychedelic nature, but the new version adds extra dimensions and builds the chorus into something weightier and more anthemic. Both versions fit right in and are standout moments on their respective albums, though. Paragon is the moment where the album sounds most of its time, and I'd understand if you thought the aesthetics and textures here weren't used too tastefully or had aged unflatteringly ten years on, but I find that all the different layers of dark dark, impactful synths and mangled vocals come together into something enjoyably driving and huge sounding. Sudanama is the longest and most unconventional sounding track on here, with squealing fragments of sound in the place of a melody, flying around like they're inside the Large Hadron Collider before the track melts down into unsettling choral ambience. The lyrics here are some of the most forthright and dark on the album. It's something of an anomaly in one of maybe their less emotionally weighty records, but definitely among the most compelling pieces here. Then Terminal is surprisingly melodic and ballad-like, continually building up a pretty strong reflective atmosphere over its four minutes. I initially thought that Overdose was perhaps not the strongest closer, a bit of a short, weird moment to be their final album's final statement, but it turns out it was meant as a hidden track and was an unused composition from the first few years of the band. Plus having its final line be Call That Dog A Home brings us back to the core concept behind the band, and being life through a dog's eyes. And there we have it, Weapon is a highly enjoyable, conclusive statement from Skinny Puppy that heads straight for your feet with a whole load of straightforward, well-constructed bangers that take us back to where the band started, as well as bringing new ideas and aesthetics. I'm not sure what the general consensus from the band's fanbase is, but Honestly, this might be my favourite album of theirs post Last Rites, and if they never make another album, which seems fairly likely at this point, I'm totally content with this being their final release. The band has still been regularly performing live shows ever since, and are now on what they've labelled their final tour. No European or UK dates have been announced yet, but after making this video, I'd say colour me interested. And with that, I guess we finally come to the end of this discography review. Can I just say I've had a fantastic time listening to all of these albums and putting this video together. It's taken several months of my time, but I've so appreciated being kind of pushed out of my comfort zone with this request, discovering enjoyment and appreciation for a style of music I was previously very unfamiliar with. I do love when my followers expand my horizons. This has been several months in the making if you consider all the listening and preparation, and I don't know if I'm ever going to go into quite this level of depth again uh, for a band who have released so many albums, but I feel really proud that I've been able to deliver such an in-depth video. This might be one of my favourites I've ever made. So luckily now I'm finally on a nice big holiday, so I'm going to be able to carry out a lot more plans on this channel and also have some other creative projects in the works. But for now, thank you very much Zach Adams for sending in this request, and thank you all for watching. See you next time.